Hello everyone, welcome to our first day seminar of 2022. Uh, we have Marcus Hardy here from DeepMind. Um, but before I pass over to Marcus, I'll do a quick acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people on whose land we host this seminar. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. So take it away, Marcus. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for showing up. So plentiful. Um, yeah, so um, so this is work. So normally I work on, on AGI, um, but I got involved in this HMI uh, project very early on. Um, Seth sort of really wanted me uh, to be in this project. And I thought maybe I should do something in this area. And I was probably the first one um, in HMI to, to do some research. Um, but beyond this work, I, I didn't work um, in this area anymore. Um, but there's plenty of more to do um, um, with respect to this idea. And you will see, it's just, you know, idea. And, you know, I thought this idea can't be new. And I still sort of think, you know, maybe 50 years ago, somebody uh, presented, um, I had this idea because it's really simple. Also, on the other hand, I, I talked about this uh, to various people and you know, some had even difficulties understanding it, although I think it's really, really super simple. I mean, making it work in practice, there's, you know, more things to do. Okay, let me start. Um, so this is about fairness. And the, without regret means, um, you know, various ideas out there uh, to achieve fair solutions, but often they come at a cost. I mean, Bob Williamson has a paper about the cost of fairness. I could have called it cost, but Sort of regret is the difference between an optimal solution and what we can achieve. And so this difference um, in this solution is actually really zero, uh, which I think is quite nice. So um, first give motivation, the main idea. Um, it's a bit abstract, but uh, don't worry, I go through a uh, running example um, throughout the talk. Uh, then I give the classical um, approach to fairness um, by constraining the solution space. Uh, then the main idea, fairness uh, without regret. Um, and then some um, details, um, which I don't have time to talk here about, which are um, also important. Okay, so, um, so first some terminology. The goal um, here is to optimize some primary objective while also caring about a secondary objective. Okay. And when I talk about optimal or best or solution quality or regret or something is relevant or comparable or so, I always refer to the primary objective, okay? And when I talk about fairness or just or equitable or so, that refers to this secondary criteria we also care about. And this is quite abstract. So um, for this talk, it doesn't really matter when we talk about just or equitable or fair. It is just, you know, it's a mathematical function. So I usually use the word fair um, without implying, you know, that they are all um, the same. So, so, you know, these details don't matter for this talk. Okay, so here is the one classical solution of achieving fair solution. So let S be a solution space. Say um, potential students you can admit uh, to a university. And then you have some objective which you want to maximize. Um, maybe, you know, you want to hire, uh, admit the students, you know, which have the best high school grades or highest IQ or whatever. Um, 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 there's a Scala um, admission criterion and you just, you know, select, you know, maybe um, a couple of students which maximize this criterion, whatever that is. Okay. Sometimes these solutions appear to be unfair and we want to do something about it. And um, a popular bit crude and brute force approach is to just constrain the solution space. Rather than considering all potential solutions, right, um, we just limit the solution space to solutions which we deem to be fair, okay? Uh, the problem is that in general that reduces the solution quality. So fair optimal solutions are inferior to um, if you just ignore uh, the fairness. Um, so that's also sometimes called the accuracy fairness trade-off. Uh, for instance, a paper by uh, uh, by Bob uh, Williamson in 2018. Okay, there's another problem um, that often we should not be or cannot be very certain about the objective itself. So you know, think about student admission, and we have all kinds of criteria. And how do we 
aggregate this into one number, right? Um, I mean, nobody would argue there's a unique way, you know, what is more important, you know, is the grade more important or your extracurricular activity or IQ or, or whatever. And maybe we have some feeling that all these things are somehow relevant, but what's the relative weighting, for instance, or even are they additive or multiplicative and so on. So, um, or if you think even grander, you know, about life goals, I mean, you know, the life goals may be food, shelter, family, education, entertainment, health, wealth, or so whatever. And to putting this into a similar, single number, we can do that, but I don't think we will ever agree on, you know, a, a unique way of doing that. Okay. But I will turn this problem actually into a feature. Okay. Um, so um, I use the problem uh, that the primary objective is often itself uncertain um, in order to get fairer solutions. Okay. So instead of looking at a single objective, see that here. Um, let's be more honest and look at, you know, a set of objectives. Let's assume we have a committee and, you know, we can't agree what is the right criterion and maybe we just take all the um, suggestions from the committee or the convex hull or whatever. So then we have a set of objectives and, well, for each objective, you tether, uh, you know, this parameter space can be discrete, continuous or whatever. I give examples later. Um, we consider or look at the optimal solution. So for each utility U tether, we get an optimal solution S star theta. And by design, this optimal solutions, they are incomparable, right? I mean, the optimal solution with criterion A and with B, they're optimal in their own right. And you cannot really say, you know, which one is better unless you would have a meta criterion or something like this. Okay. And um, so now, we have this set of optimal solutions. And now we consider secondary criterion, they have fairness criterion. We say a solution has a certain fairness, um, you know, real number, and we want to maximize fairness. And we can easily do that by just picking out of this set of optimal solutions, the one which is deemed to be most fair. And because all these optimal solutions are incomparable, we're not really compromising on the first optimality criterion. And um, yeah, so that's here. Then we take sort of all the optimal solutions with respect to the different tethers and take the arc marks over theta, and then we have the optimal fair solution. And in a sense, that's all that is. Okay. And now I just go into, through the more details, um, 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 an example and how that might work. So, but before I do that, let me say what I'm not talking about. So first, you know, there's no probabilities, no machine learning, no fancy optimization algorithm, although we need a fancy optimization algorithm. It's a bi-level optimization problem, um, um, which is very uh, tricky. Um, so for large scale problems, we need to solve this problem. I mean, there are packages, but probably a custom made solution um, would be useful. Um, so I also will not discuss, you know, um, how we come up with fairness notions and of the objectives. You just have a primary objective, you have a fairness notion, um, and in this way, you can get fairer solution. Um, I also don't consider you know, bias in the data, uh, which is a big issue. So you have to de-bias the data somehow, which is difficult, but maybe not impossible. Um, I'm also not presenting a ready algorithm unless you just take an off-the-shelf bi-level optimization algorithm, which may be good enough. So there's plenty of more left for you if you want to work on that. Okay, so uh, I think I can just skip to this. So there's some related work of bias and fairness, fairness enhancing interventions. And you know, this notion of fairness is, as you probably all know, is very contradictory or contentious and controversial. And uh, Brian, what is it, like Hedden or so, uh, he gave the first HMI talk um, here. He um, had a very interesting take on this. Um, how these different notions um, you cannot satisfy. So essentially you can only have calibration. If you want calibration, then all the other um, traditional fairness notions go out of the window. Um, yeah, the bias in the data I will not address. Um, and well, here's some work which um, achieves or tries to achieve fairness by constraints, which I you know, argue is inferior to this, to this new idea. Okay, so how does fairness by constraint work? Um, so you have an overall score U, um, so I, I just just give you an example rather than sort of the general theory. There's anyway, there's not much to the general theory. 
either. Um, so I assume you just consider IQ and grade of the students. And the IQ is between 50 and 200, or I mean, realistically, maybe a more narrow range and grade between zero and 10. And um, both you think are relevant, maybe equally, but we cannot just add them because you know the scale is totally different. The scale is totally different. It's from 50 to 20, 200, it's from 0 to 10. So maybe we rescale the IQ by 10, then it's 5 to 20 and 0 to 10. That seems to be now a comparable scale. And then we can maybe add them up. Yeah. Or um, let's take a weighted average um, of IQ divided by 10 and grade and choose theta to be 1 half um, if you deem they're equally important. So here's some examples. So I just you know, um, invented um, six students with IQ and grade. Um, and here's just the initial of the students. And here you see them um, on, on this 2D plot, you know, horizontally is the IQ, vertically is the, um, is the grade. And, um, and now the fairness criterion um, will be on the next slide, will be you know, with respect to gender. And you see here that blues are male and the, and the red are female. Okay, so, um, so solution basis S, we maximize the motility function, which I defined on the previous slide, we say theta one half which seems to be reasonable to get the optimal solution. And in the example, we have six students. Um, let's say we can only admit two students. I mean, of course, it's a very small example. Um, and um, so the, the, the total score is, of course, just the score um, of the two students, which um, we want to admit. Um, so we take the arc marks over all subsets of students in this population. Um, restricted to that we can only admit two students and this gives us the optimal solution. And in this case, it's a simple threshold strategy. We look for the best student with respect to U one half and then the second best student. And this will give us Bob and Zach. So um, if you quickly look at this diagram, um, since these criteria are equally weighted, so the diagonal lines here um, are the ISO lines. So when you look at Bob and Zach, they lie on the most left uh, top right part. So these are the best students with respect to this criteria. Okay. Okay. So, um, so here, because we admit two students, so it would be actually more appropriate to plot pairs of students. So we take all pairs of students, there are 15 pairs of students, uh, some have their IQ and some their grade. And then we have this plot here, these are just the initials. But then also, if you look at the diagonal here, um, you see B set, which is Bob and Zach, they lie on the diagonal and they are optimal. And it's just you know, a different way of, um, uh, of presenting that and, or reducing it to, to selecting a single point in a solution space. Okay, so, um, so that was an optimal solution by, by definition. And um, so maybe some people think this is not fair because we admitted two males, despite if you look at the average IQ of the females and the average um, grade of the females and then the males, they're exactly the same. So the average is 120 for the IQ and eight for males. So they seem to be sort of, you know, have equal qualities, but for some reason, um, this system admitted two men. Okay. So, um, you know, some approaches to um, have quotas. Let's say we have a quota of at least 30% women. I mean, if you have just two people, I mean, you can only have 0% or 50%. Um, okay. So, um, so what we do now, or what the, the constraint approach does, is um, you um, decrease the size of the solution space to fair solutions. You have this fairness function, uh, which is either fair or unfair, and you only take the solutions which are fair. Okay. And um, then you just maximize with respect to the fair solutions. And if you do that in the example, um, in the example, you get. Um, you can just look at the diagram and then shift the diagonal um, and only consider the fair solutions. Um, you get um, Bob or Sack together with you know, Amy, Eve, or Isa. Um, so in this case, there are six fair, so equally good fair solutions. And what you also see, um, if you just you know, add the numbers, you see that the fair solution gets you a score of 21, while um, the optimal solutions without fairness constraint gives you 22. So there's a cost to it. So you lose you know, either one grade or 10 IQ points um, um, by um, insisting on a fair solution. Okay. Um, so, and that's the reason why I call it regret. Um, so, so this is the optimal solution here. This is the optimal fair solution. And it, generically, you know, this is, this is larger than zero and that's the regret or the cost. Um, you, you suffer from fairness. 
Okay, so how can we avoid this? Okay, it seems impossible. Um, but as I mentioned, I mean, we just wait, you know, IQ and grade 50 50. And, you know, it is plausible, but um, we could, um, for instance, you know, if we just take the grade and differentiate between STEM and Husk grade, and then say, so, okay, we have Q, STEM grade, Husk grade, and maybe they're equally important. So make one third, one third, one third. And if you split it in this way, you would weigh a Q of one third and the grade uh, two third, which seems to be also quite plausible. And it's really hard to you know, argue that one is better than the other. So we already have a range here of the parameter theta, right, between one half and one third, which seems really completely incomparable. Okay. Um, so, so what we do, we turn this problem into a feature. Um, so we consider now a um, set of optimality criteria. So for each theta, which we deem to be reasonable, um, we consider um, this um, um, utility u theta. Um, for each theta, we get an optimal solution with respect to, I should call it theta optimal solution. And as I mentioned, by assumption, they're really incomparable. And then we design a second fairness criterion. Um, in this case, um, it should not be sort of a binary fair or not fair, but sort of graded somehow more fair or less fair. Um, and then in this set of solutions, um, we try to find the, um, uh, the fairest solution, okay? So this one um, on the left-hand side is sort of the, among the optimal solutions, it is the most fair one. And this one here is sort of which theta in my set of reasonable utility functions led to the optimal fair solution. Okay, so in the example, um, so let's assume now, so I argued sort of one third seems to be good. So maybe two third is also fine. So let's just take the interval between one third and two third, which I think is totally fine. And let's say um, the fairness criterion is the difference between male and female admissions where with a minus, so we don't want to minimize that or the minus we want to maximize. So zero would be the best. And um, so what you can see in the simple example um, for theta star um, to be 0.5, Three five, it's just a random number in the interval. I mean, yeah, I think between one quarter and, which is outside of the interval, and I can't remember anymore. Um, you know, the, um, the, there's a there's a um, a range where it works. Um, you um, achieve um, uh, the solution um, um, will be uh, Amy and Zach. So um, so the fairness criterion will be zero. So maximize. So this is a fair solution. Okay. So now, if you look at the solution and we calculate um, the, the, the utility with respect to theta star of this fair solution, which is 20.1, and we calculate the unconstrained solution, which is 22, it also looks like that this fair solution is inferior. Uh, but that is an illusion because we are comparing here apple with pears. So these two quantities, so different u tetras should never be compared. And I could easily add a constant to the u theta. So if I add just say, um, um, I add um, um, yeah, I mean the optimization is here. Let me see. So here you maximize um, over s. So if I add here any function of theta, the maximum will be exactly the same. Okay, and here in this optimization, it doesn't really matter. So I could just add to u theta some function of theta and the optimization criterion and the fairness criterion would be unaffected. And then if I add this appropriate number, I could easily even achieve here on the left hand side some higher number. I could, you know, achieve whatever I want, 100 or whatever, right, by just adding a constant. So the fair solution looks even better than the the, the general solution, also strictly speaking, I mean, you really can't compare them. That's the whole point. Um, okay, so some comments. Um, so this is very generic, doesn't rely on any specific utility function or criterion F and also I mean, it doesn't, can be continuous or discrete, can be linear or nonlinear. I mean, this example was linear for instance. Um,
yeah. Um, it doesn't solve the problem, right? You know, which criterion and which attributes you use. I mean, this is it's the same with this or with the, with the constraint based solution. Um, but in a sense, it's easier because you don't have to, um, you know, uh, if you don't mind a mistake, you just put it also in the pool of utility functions. Um, um, and, and it's not as severe as if you just fix a very specific utility function, which turns out to be sort of maybe not the, the right one or a suboptimal one. Okay, so here, let me go through the protocol, how you should apply that. So the first is um, you choose your space S or sort of the attributes you want to consider um, um, in your objective. Um, then um, you look at a class of utility functions um, in the simplest case, it would be a linear combination. And then um, you should choose a reasonable class. And I'm thinking here about a committee who sits there and, you know, we, we have these ATAR scores and, uh, and whatever the, the scores at the universities and then University Central comes up with all kinds of formulas. And I guess it's a committee and um, they probably don't agree. And what they should do is everyone puts sort of their own um, hopefully um, um, reasonable opinion in, and then maybe you just take the convex hull um, of all these suggestions, what is a reasonable um, primary objective that gives you class uh, theta and then the class of utility functions. And then again, you choose some fairness criterion and what you deem uh, to be fair. <clears throat> and then the rest is in some calculation. Right. And you should do that in this order, right? You should not, you know, like I presented, oh, you know, I find the optimal solutions. Oh, okay, there's two, two, two male students. Hmm, oh, that's unfair. Let's just rig the system somehow, right, to make it fair. So it's better to follow this protocol. I mean, first you have the, um, um, the, the, the set of utility functions, then you have a fairness criterion, and then you crank the handle. And then, you know, ideally you accept the outcome um, because once you start iterating, um, you start to rigging the system. Okay, so um, so now some details uh, which are skipped over. Um, this is a very nasty um, optimization problem. So it's a bi-level optimization problem. Um, it's actually a special case, so it's not a generic one. So maybe there are, that would be an interesting sort of research project for for you know from the computer science um, side um, whether this special structure uh, can be exploited. Uh, to get more efficient algorithms, because in general, it's, it's a really hard problem. Um, one could try, um, and, and you know, you, you can read a little bit in, in, in the in the in the tech report which you have out there. Um, one could try just you know gradient descent. You know, that's always the first choice, and it's, it's a double optimization, uh, but you can differentiate through the arc max, um, and um, you get some um, sort of dual alternating. Um, you know, I like in games like a saddle point optimization. Um, unfortunately, for the linear case, it's easy to see that it completely breaks down. Um, but on the other hand, if it's linearly parameterized, this problem is very close to multi-objective optimization and Pareto optimality. Um, so, um, so if you have a multi-objective optimization problem and you look at the Pareto front, and then you clip the Pareto front to the allowed solutions, so which are in, 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 the, in the set theta. And then you optimize, you find the, op, the, the most fair solution in this Pareto front, then this is sort of an algorithm for, um, for this bi-level optimization in this special case of a linear um, a combination. And there are algorithms out there for, for, for finding the Pareto front. Okay, um, so from the machine learning perspective, I mean, usually, you know, I mean, you know, we want some machine learning here, right? So there's, there's no machine learning so far. Um, so rather than hand designing utility functions or people, you know, have data, right? We have past students and then their future success rate, whatever that is, you know, you know, income or a positive contribution to society. And maybe that can inform us to improve um, um, the, the utility function or the objective we are designing rather than just, you know, guessing by hand. And indeed it should but it will never shrink it down to a point, right? So first, I mean, we only have finite data, so we can only estimate these parameters to finite precision. And even if we had infinite data, right, then we probably disagree on what does it mean for a student to be successful later, right? You know, is it, you know, um, uh, 
annual income or lifelong income or is it positive contribution to society um, or whatever so then we just have sort of this disagreement on 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 a higher level and then we would get a you know a, a tri-level optimization problem um, so um, while machine learning can help to 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 make this space more narrow um it will still be will be a, still be a step okay oh i'm pretty good in time it really happens um so um so that's sort of a summary and a discussion um perfect fairness cannot always be a ah no sorry i didn't mention that um so while this approach which i called power um can improve fairness and this example sort of achieve perfect fairness um it not necessarily achieves perfect fairness so i mean sort of if the set is too small um, then even sort of the most fair solution, I mean, it's fairer usually than, you know, um, taking a fixed criterion, but it is not maybe sort of perfectly fair. But on the other hand, um, if you constrain your solution space, you know, then um, you get suboptimal solutions, which is not good. And also this fairness business is pretty controversial, right? I mean, there's so many different notions um, and people cannot agree on it. So, so maybe it's actually better not to strive for perfect fairness with respect to a questionable criterion, but just to improve the fairness with respect to um, criterion we, we can e more easily um, agree on. Um, yeah, so yeah, I said, you know, if you have a set of objectives, um, you know, that solves a lot of contentions, but also, I mean, maybe we cannot agree on this set, yeah? But I would argue it's easier to be on a set and you know, in the easiest case, you have five experts and you just take, you know, this convex hull and, you know, that's it. Um, so it should be easier to agree on a set rather than on a, on a single point. Um, you know, some ethicists don't like um, machines to make ethical decisions. Um, but if you look at the protocol, there's actually four out of five steps um, under human control. And on the last step, when you're doing, done the optimization, the, the machine does it. So there's a lot of human control is there, but as I recommended, do that in the, in the order, not to rig the system. And, you know, I made a lot of simplifying assumptions. I mean, especially that the data is not biased. Um, and, um, well, that's how science works. I mean, sort of these last four points are, you know, the critique I got from, and I gave this talk previously, um, that this is really, you know, um, there's, there's even a paper about the abstraction fallacy or five abstraction fallacies in, in, in fairness research. And of course, I'm aware of that. Um, but, you know, you start, you know, with a uh, simplified uh, uh, problem setting, and then you have to, of course, embed it, you know, um, into, a, into a practical solution. Which someone else has to do. Um, so maybe I mean, those who don't know, that's not my area of research. I usually work on, on you know, theoretical general AI. Um, and that was just, you know, a, a brief stint into fairness in machine learning. And I'm not working on that anymore. Okay, and you know, the, I don't claim that this is perfect, but what I claim that um, it's fairness without regret, this approach is at least superior to fairness with constraint. Yeah. Of course, you know, it doesn't solve all problems. And what has to be done? Um, so we can have stochastic uncertainty in the data and we can also have stochastic uncertainty in the objective. You know, maybe even the objective can only evaluate it probabilistically, and I haven't treated that. Um, that should not be too hard. Um, if you have missing data, um, I don't have that on the slide. If you have missing data, then you have to do data imputation. And it looks like that you could just use the similar approach here. You just impute the data in such a way that you get the fair solution. Um, but this was, would get you actually an extremely unfair solution. So you can read um, in, in the tech report and um, why the data imputation it doesn't work in the same way as sort of um, objective function imputation. Okay, as I mentioned, bias data I have not treated, which is a big issue. Um, mentioned machine learning could help, so it would be nice to sort of combine it. Um, and maybe the, 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 the most interesting next step would be to quantify how much fairness you gain by this approach. So you, you look at the, the optimal solution and the optimal fair solution and compare their fairness level. And I think you cannot say much in general. So you have to look at a concrete instantiation of the problem, um, you know, 
you know, on the utility function um, as a fairness criterion. And of course, you know, the larger the space or the size of the uh, utility function, and the more fairer, because it includes more and more optimal solutions, the more fairer um, and then the optimal fair solution um, will be. Okay. Um, yeah, and finally, this very hard optimization problem, which, yeah, have to be solved. Okay, here's some references. And wow, that's the end of the talk. It's, I think, the first time in my life that I ended early. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if people on Zoom can hear me because we have some mic problems. So maybe. Uh, well, you can speak into this mic. Well, yeah, you can share. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I guess if people have questions on Zoom, they should uh, write the questions in the in the chat. It's going to be easier. Um, but so maybe I can I can start actually with a question. So. Um, uh, this approach is presented in case you have like a single question, a one-shot question, one-shot decision. Uh, what can you apply it if it's like continuous? You you mean sort of like sequential decision making? Um, I mean, if we're talking about uh, making decisions about known applications where you get new um, or online new instances every five minutes for the next ten years. Sort of reinforcement learning. Um, but but you mean sort of I get new instances and then I want to update my previous solution because I have say more students triple in. More knowledge and um, one I mean knowledge in which I mean okay so and you've got more instances with the results and um, yeah, more students, right, as well? No, that's yeah. different. More students would be sort of, you, you have more students and kick some previous ones out. <laughs> um, and more knowledge would be that maybe okay. at the beginning you don't have all their right. grades or something and then the grades. Um, I have not thought about it in this context, but it seems like, I mean, at least abstractly, I mean, if you have new knowledge on your students, right, you just run the system again and you get a new solution. And um, practically, of course, you would hope, you know, that there's an incremental way of, um, you know, yeah, if you have graded descent, you would start with a previous solution and then adapt the solution or something like this. Yeah. Um, not sure whether there's anything specific um, in this idea and in relation to new information. I mean, maybe in the bi-level optimization literature, there's probably, you know, if you have, you know, um, parameterized problem and you change the parameter slightly, um, how then to update your solution. Um, then we'll ask uh, Cathy and then Sarita. Um, yeah, thanks, Marcus. Uh, so I just wanted to say, um, yeah, I think this is a really a, a great intervention into this debate. And um, it's it really rings true, I think, with the way that people rationalize sort of affirmative action in many contexts. So for instance, in university hiring, you know, we're all aware that we want to, say, have more women um, in faculty, right? And legally, you're only supposed to use fairness as a tiebreaker. Um, but I think in practice, what people have realized is that, um, you know, we've in the past been working with a very narrow notion of merit and what makes a good faculty member. And that, you know, if we sort of allow for different criteria and allow some incomparability between, you know, being good at on certain utility functions, as you say, um, then there's sort of a broader space of uh, maximal people that you can apply your tiebreaker to. Right? So, I mean, the tiebreaker rule seems quite restrictive, but if you have a broader idea of what makes a good candidate, then you, you get more candidates coming in. But it, it sort of tracks exactly the kind of thing that you're trying to model here precisely, having a multi-objective um, uh, goal. It's not clear how to weigh up the objectives. Um, so yeah, I guess this is just a comment to say, I actually think 
it looks sort of fancy and technical, but this is exactly what people want to do when they're wanting to implement affirmative action um, measures, I think. Yeah, um, I was curious that you talked that uh, that you called my talk an intervention into the discussion. <laughs> um, I think it's a different approach. You yeah, know, it's. I, I wouldn't call it tiebreaker because it. I mean, tiebreaking. It doesn't really break ties. It allows for, um, uh, for 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 uh, non-total ordering, right, and for incomparable candidates. Um, and tiebreaking sounds like okay, this candidate has zero point seven, this zero point seven, and then we tie break. And here, but, but maybe you're meaning that, right? Um, so, so here it's really, these candidates are really incomparable in the sense um, I have defined. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's very similar. Yeah. 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 So that, that's, that's really, I just want to cheer, yeah. cheer on the, uh, this way of doing things. It's a, I think it's an intervention compared to the standard way that the algorithmic fairness discussion has gone, where there's no, there's no questioning of, how we should perceive the goal, the objective function, and it's all about, you know, um, how we uh, measure, how we balance fairness versus achieve best achieving the goal. And I like the fact that you're sort of questioning what the goal should be. Yeah, thanks. Which is very interesting, right? You know, I mean, it's, since you know, university is trying to do something which is similar, you would expect that then, you know, uh, the fairness community tries to sort of formalize. Uh, this approach, which um, apparently has not been done. Um, I mean, who knows, um, but uh, I couldn't find anything in the literature and so far nobody pointed it out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what was more about the feedback system, for example, and power system, say, uh, when we have more concrete objectives, for example, when we want to boost up the renewable energy, and sources in the system, we want to uh, maximize the renewable energy sources. But because of the network structure, some of the customers are, and the network constraints are more sensitive to some of the customers. So it is not really beneficial for the network to allow those customers to install the renewable energy sources. Mm -hmm. But it is not fair. So uh, how this applying, because the um, objective is very concrete, you want to install as much as resources in the system, how uh, this approach is going to be helpful in that sense. I don't know exactly the setting, but I can imagine that. Um, so um, if, well, the, 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 the power plants or whatever, you know, have a very precise criterion, what is good um, or what is environmental friendly or so on, and everyone agrees on it, that's the criterion then this approach doesn't help you, right? Because it says, okay, I mean, if that's the optimal liquor, can you have to use it? But usually, right? I mean, for instance, how do we measure the environmental impact, right? I mean, there's large disagreement um, how to measure the cost of the future cost, you know, and also over how many generations CO2 or so um, will lead to. But you should sort of be honest and, you know, estimate, okay, so maybe that's the, 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 the the smallest estimate and the largest estimate, and then you have a range here yeah, of what does it cost to have not the renewable energy or um, not, you know, allowing these people to, uh, uh, to, 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 to put power in the grid or whatever. And you just, you know, look at the, I mean, it should not be sort of, you know, from minus infinity to infinity, but you have uh, a range where you feel, you know, this captures the truth somehow. Um, and then you crank the handle here um, and then if there is a point in this utility space, right, so that these users can feed in without causing too much harm, then you will get a fair or more fair solution. But even if then they cannot feed in uh, the electricity, or I didn't understand it completely yet, um, then they're out of luck um, in this framework either, right? Then you have to go to hard measures like fairness constraints, and then really you reduce the, the overall solution quality for society. Thank you so much, yeah. awesome. Uh, I want to push on Alban's point because I think that Alban just left there. Um, in particular, I think that it comes up when you're thinking about uh, like a decision problem where there's both a component of distribution of, of like distributing goods where you would think fairness would play a role, 
and uh, and something about learning where you think it might uh, you might want to support it off. And um, in in particular, uh, I think that like when you're doing a one shot decision, you're absolutely right that like there's so much uncertainty in how you specify your objective that it doesn't like you can completely just choose the one that also happens to meet your fairness considerations. But once you once you're in a sort of like yeah I guess online learning situation, um, as once you start doing that, you're basically you're biasing the dynamics of that learning towards a particular path in the safe space. And so so here's an example. We're thinking about like IP. That's that's one you talked about here. Um, you might think that there's there's one thing that you're trying it's trying to do both of those things essentially. It's trying to measure like like particular kind of robust like uh, aptitudes in a population. Um, and on the other, it's like it then it's then inevitably going to bleed into how we distribute goods in society. Um, and so there's so much like uncertainty in that objective. Like there's it's it's actually break, breaks down into a bunch of different components and different aptitudes, which have different weights, and there are different choices of how to measure each component. Um, and so you might say, okay, well, given that it's going to feed into this distribution problem, let's choose the one that um, makes it so that IQ is like the most kind of fairly distributed. Like more evenly distributed across like the global population, um, and that would make. But then the problem is that that there, there's a concern. This is how this, I think is reflected in the debate about this sort of scientific practice, um, which is that when when you do that every single time, then you're kind of cutting off a section of like science and scientific exploration that would like that would look at different ways that you could have measured it, right? And so it's. It's like you're not just making the decision for this one time distribution, you're making a decision kind of in perpetuity for science that this is how every time we're gonna we're gonna do this. And and somehow that 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 feels for a lot of people, I think, that it that it unduly biases the trajectory of science. And so I guess I'm, I'm curious. I most likely have not understood the, the question or the comment. So I try to um so so that the two things, but maybe they're sort of yeah. re somehow related. One is um, if you just take sort of IQ, um, and but you know it, there, there are multiple facets, right? And it's just one aggregate number uh, does not um, is not enough to really capture, say, the diversity and what society needs. In this case, I would just say, I mean, you break it up. I mean, in the IQ case, for this example, there, there's a visual and there's a linguistic, and then there, there's, there's just the mathematical stuff, right? And you just break it up, and then you have three scores, right? And then you apply the same technique, right? Rather than just having one score, you, you use these three scores. And, um, um, but the other question, I think that was more like that over time, somehow you say that this will bias the system or the society more and more because it's, because it's sort of used over longer time periods. So I didn't understand. Oh, I, I and this. Yeah, so this is, I think, the point. I, like, I think you're absolutely right that there's enough uncertainty in the objective function that like, you could just choose the one that, that like, meets the fairness objective. But yeah. I think it rubs people the wrong way, maybe, that, yeah, it, it biases the learning, right? Like, it, the learning action is something you do where you, you use this measure and you take a measurement and then you feed it back and then oh. you take more measurements. Yeah, but can you give an example? How the learning biases the system or the society in the long run. I mean, in general, like what you're saying is that, um, like, like if scientists are coordinating to use like one measure so that they can kind of compare the results across each other, um, yeah. and they decide they find and they sort of standardize what IQ is, right? Um, and if they and and I think there's a concern maybe that if you use kind of fairness considerations in that, where it's supposed to be a purely like uh, learning based thing. Um, then that means that the sort of every time you go out and measure things with an eye towards this measure as opposed to a different one, you're you're learning something a little different, um, and that might not be a problem because you don't know exactly what you're trying to learn. But if everybody simultaneously is 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 trying to optimize for for one thing instead of another, you're you're moving what you can. Like you're you're shrinking, I guess, the state space of what could be learned. Okay, um, maybe I understood it, maybe not, but I just answer a different question. Okay. And maybe someone else can sort of maybe clarify what your real question is. So um, there's one thing I write about in the, in the report. So um, sometimes, you know, if you, you have a big 
project or whatever, or um, diversity is good because you need an engineer, you need a social scientist, you need, you need a, a mathematician and so on. So we need this diversity um, for, for, for having a great team to achieve something, okay? And maybe that's what you're hinting at. If you have one criteria and you optimize for that, then you only hire engineers maybe or something like this, which is not good, yeah? So this is, a, this is different from what I've talked about. So if your objective is to say, design a rocket, right? Um, to Mars, right? And you know, there's humans in on Mars, you need, you know, an engineer, you need a computer scientist, you need a social scientist or whatever, right? If this is the objective to fly to Mars, then um, in order to achieve that, we need this diverse group of people. And so you have to put this into the objective itself, right? Because if you design the objective, like, you know, maximizing the number of, you know, highest IQ engineers, right? And then something on a social scale goes wrong, right? You know, you know, then you have designed the wrong objective. And this is not addressed by this work, right? So, um, I mean, some people want diversity just for diversity's sake, right? Or say, you know, diversity is a form of fairness. Then you put it in the fairness part. But if the diversity itself is relevant for achieving the objective, you have to design your objective in such a way um, that it achieves this, at least within this framework. Um, so there are many questions, so we're going to move on. Um, so Patrick Classroom had a question. Um, so he's saying that you're using a lexical ordering uh, on, the, on the objectives. And so what he argues is that uh, you, should, um, you should treat fairness as a criterion and just add it up with the utility function and then compute the power to front yeah. So. Um, well, we could do it, but why is it a good idea? And what is the relative weighting? Um, do you do sort of, you know, you choose the weight in such a way that you get, you know, a solution which is as fair as you want to have? And also, you know, they could be on different scales, right? Um, I mean, I don't say that I don't have these problems, but um, I, I think it would just be um, I mean, if you would add up fairness with utility with a parameter lambda, and you vary lambda from, from zero to infinity, right, you would get a Pareto front, mm -hmm. right, yeah, which then yeah. sort of, you, you trade off fairness with optimality. But how far are you allowed to go? But, I mean, when you have multiple objectives, that's what you're doing anyway, right? So you have to choose a lambda to compare different Objective. Yeah, but I, um, okay, you can argue I choose these tethers, right? But I'm not sure how would I choose, so I have sort of the, the, the discrepancy between male and female students, and then I have an ATAR score. How would I weigh them a priori without looking at the result and choosing the parameter in such a way that the outcome is what I want? I would have quite difficulties. But the, but, but, your, your answer yeah. is that this is an elegant method to not have to choose this parameter. Yes, yeah. And also, you don't get regret, right? Yes, yes, and I don't get, mm -hmm. uh, get zero regret with There's this so method, yeah. Yeah, but that's important. You choose that before the fact and based on on your honest belief on how important are these different criteria in order to say achieve you know highest income later or or best grades or a positive impact in society and not looking at the fairness part. I think that's 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 crucial. That's a crucial difference. Okay, maybe I have not understood. So I thought this is I thought this is what you're doing. You've got uh, uh, a whole range for theta, right? And then basically you're going to find uh, the set of optimal solution, uh, one for each theta, right? Which gives you a Pareto front restricted to this to this theta thing. And then what I thought you did is among those pick up uh, among those optimal those points on the part of front 
pick up uh, those for which the fairness is optimal. Yeah, but the point is, I don't take the whole Pareto front. No. I only take, and by the way, this Pareto front picture only works if you linearly combine criteria, right? So this approach, I mean, if I multiplicatively combine them or so, so I'm, I'm um, okay, let, let's first stick, you know, with the linear combination, right? So I only look at the part of the Pareto front where I believe, so, so I assume I have this IQ and grade, right? Um, it would be quite disingenuous to say, you know, IQ is not relevant at all or a grade is not relevant at all. So I definitely exclude, or it's just relevant for 5%. So I would say, you know, maybe between 20% and 80%, I would be fine. And that's the important thing that you, that you restrict it to a reasonable range. And, um, and then look for, for the optimal fair solution in this restricted range. And uh, second, this Pareto front picture and multi-objective optimization way of dealing with this only works if you have um, linear completely combined um, sub goals, right? And it could be an arbitrary complex function, right? Nonlinear. Um, and then you, you cannot drizzle that out. So, so I have a sub goals, right? And it could be an arbitrary complex function, right? Nonlinear. Um, and then you, you cannot drizzle that out. So, so I have a, um, um, so normally Pareto front is you have one criterion here, one criterion here. Okay. And you have the diagram, right? And the Pareto front is optimal, or every point on the Pareto front is optimal with respect to some specific linear com linear combination of this criterion. But linear is just a special case, um, which is you know happens often. Um, but um, you know there can be much more complicated linear objective functions. Is computing this for -linear well, with a it's a bi-level optimization problem, and you just you know crank the handle. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Me? Uh, I think you raised your hand for quite some while. Um, I guess it, it seems to me, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that there's, a, there's a, what I'm going to call a meta fairness kind of problem, because we use fairness in, in, in context here. But it, it seems like if you were to run a competition and you were going to tell the competitors that you were going to grade them this way, there was a, there was a, there was a range of possible objective functions. Mm -hmm. And then we were going to find whoever we were going to score all the entrants and pick the winner according to each of those possible objectives. Yeah. And then we were going to hit it with the fairness criterion to choose after all the scores are submitted, yeah. which objective function we use. That doesn't sound like a competition like I want to take part in. It seems it, it, that, that seems like it's unfair. It's, it, maybe it's unfair. It seems unfair because it's subject to manipulation, maybe, right? Where somebody who could come after the fact could, could, could poison the objective functions that they don't do well with unfair solutions. So that those objective functions don't be evaluated, forcing you on the back end to use an objective function that's favorable to them. So you're sort of picking how grades are assigned after the scores are submitted, so you don't know upfront what you need to do to win. Um, that doesn't seem, in some sense, fair, but in a different sense than to use the word in the, in the talk. Is that? Am I missing something? Or um, okay, would you say that this system, or would you say that constraining the solution space is more unfair or equally unfair or less unfair? You just say, okay, we admit 30% women, that's it. That doesn't feel like it's um, subject to sort of like adversarial things. Like it doesn't feel like it's manipulable in the same ways that this is. Um, okay, so I don't think that it's in any way manipulable. So because um, you, I mean, the, 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 the attributes are sent in, right? The scores in the IQ, so nobody can mess with this. And you, you should actually um, design, um, maybe I should put that in the list when you should look at the, at, at the students. So that should become just between step four and five. And then you look what you believe is important, right? And uh, get your um, relative weighting, right? And again, you don't look at the students. Um, and I, I see where you're coming from. And then you look at this bi-level optimization and say, okay, we have this pool of optimal solutions. And now we're picking one just to make it fair, right? And somebody loses out because of this, but what's the alternative? So we have this set of optimal solutions. How would you pick? I mean, they're incomparable by design. You could pick randomly, right? I don't know, maybe that's fairer, right? But um, I mean, then we should, you know, push fairness completely out of the window. 
Would you say they're um, incomparable by design? This, this 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 occurred to me a couple of times during our talk, so I'll take advantage of the fact that I have the floor to ask. Um, aren't you using the fairness criterion to compare things that you repeatedly say are incomparable by design? Isn't that what the fairness does? Well, this is a secondary criterion, okay. right? So so you know don't, the view here is we have a primary objective for whatever, right? Um, but some people think fairness is important, right? We also want to integrate it, but we don't want to really, if it's possible, to uh, degrade the primary objective. So, so the best thing would be if we can achieve both, right? Rather than to, uh, rather than having a trade-off. And you, you can do this with this method. And um, maybe you could argue, I mean, sort of expanding this primary objective to a set, right? Is sort of a trick to sneak in fairness. But I try to argue. Um, actually, to having a point utility is very hard to justify. So it's much more honest to say, well, we have this potential criteria and we cannot really tell which is better um, from the primary objective perspective. And then because we cannot really tell, you know, why not choose a fair solution? It doesn't cost anything. There's no regret. Um, of course, you know, the student who loses out yeah, you know, would not like it. He would like to have to randomize or whatever, but I mean, someone will lose out. Um, sorry, it's 12. So we're going to end this now. Oh, oh. Uh, but Marcus is going to be around for another week or so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can contact him directly. Uh, we're going to have a five minute break and then we're going to have a, uh, a short interview about your experience at uh, DeepMind. Yeah, and also afterwards, I have the rest of the day free, maybe after lunch. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm on holiday, um, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, um, so just come to me, and then you know we can I can schedule you for for, for the day, or attempt some other day if you send me an email. Thank you.